last encounter we had, uh, we saw how um, Peter and the rest of the apostles were challenged. If you're going to serve me, you need to be in love with me. You need to love. You need to know the fullness of the provision of God. You need to walk in that provision. We saw the fish on the shore. And we saw that God's call was three times he mentioned, do you love me? To go deep in, his, in your love for God. And in, in that love, you find service. Sadly, and sometimes even myself, we can be pastors and teachers and not walking in that love relationship with God. We really don't have anything to give to anybody. So fall in love with Jesus all over again. Next encounter we have uh, here is the encounter where Jesus is ascended into heaven. And so uh, we have uh, 40 days of Christ ministering uh, in post-resurrection. And in Luke chapter um, 24, in verse 50, uh, we have the conclusion of the uh, time of the resurrected Christ. And what's interesting is, because the Gospel of Luke, uh, Luke also wrote the book of Acts, we're going to go from Luke chapter 50, and then we go to the book of Acts, where he continues on. It says, He led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continual in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. So Jesus parted from them and was carried up into heaven. But we have a little more detailed account in the book of Acts, and this is uh, found in, well, I'll start from the beginning of the book of Acts chapter 1, and we'll be reading uh, down a little further down to verse 12. He says, Luke writes, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. And he did give those commandments. Uh, read them in Matthew 28. Go therefore into all the world, uh, and uh, preach the gospel, and teaching them, baptizing them. He gave those commandments to them, and to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And so forty days of Jesus revealing truth himself, and truth, as we saw on the road to Emmaus, and even when he met with the apostles in the uh, locked behind locked doors, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, testifying that he was the Christ, the Messiah, and that he needed to suffer, to die, and to rise from the dead. So Jesus, during that resurrection time, had uh, appeared at one point. It tells us in First Corinthians chapter ten. Concerning the resurrection of Jesus, many of the people could affirm this. They were alive when Paul was writing this very passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 15. And he says here, concerning the resurrection of Jesus, in, in chapter 15, we have these words concerning his resurrection. He says... Uh, he was buried, and First uh, Corinthians fifteen four. He was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. He was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by over five hundred brothers at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles, and last of all he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. That was the Apostle Paul. So uh, there was no question as to the authenticity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he was seen as Paul was writing this to the Corinthians. He had been 500 people saw Jesus at one time risen from the dead and many of them were still alive when Paul was writing this.
So there was no question as to the authenticity and the confirmation of the resurrected Lord and the ministry that he did over those 40 days would have been prolific. And so it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. And uh, so this would have been uh, while he, when he went outside of Jerusalem to Bethany that we just read about in Luke's Gospel. And so we have them gathered together and Jesus is giving them some final instructions before he leaves. Now the departure of Christ into glory would seem to be a pretty devastating thing because they had finally seen him risen from the dead. Hopes had been completely dashed and now he was leaving again. He left through death and now he leaves through ascension. But look, we will discover we do not find them um, all frustrated because they don't have the apparition, the, 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 the actual person of Jesus with them because God had given them great promises. And this encounter was not an encounter of grief and weeping. Uh, it was an encounter where, of course, they didn't want to see him go. Who would? This is Jesus, after all. And it says this. Being assembled together, in verse 4, with them, he commanded them to not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. John immersed in water, but now you'll be immersed in the Holy Spirit. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Um, sometimes their head was in a different space. And Jesus' ultimate patience as he dealt with the, the apostles. He called them, yes. Were they confused at times? Yes. Did they get the message right away? No. But it, God chooses the weak things of the world to confound the mighty. And so he chose them and called them in spite. And what do we have him, him saying here? Are, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They were still on that subject. They were still looking for an earthly kingdom to happen. They were still looking for Jesus to bring that kingdom in, a physical kingdom. So Jesus gives an answer. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Jesus said, This isn't what you need to be discussing right now. You don't need to know this. You don't need to know what God's plans are in this purpose. And his purposes are in this. They thought they did. They thought this was vital. They thought this was the central thing. They, they thought this was the, the heart of the redemption. They still had so much to learn and the Spirit of God was going to do some teaching for sure. But Jesus says, enough, enough already. Let's not get focused on this. They were looking for the, the glorious kingdom all set up. And you know, some people today are obsessed with that still. Listen, be obsessed with Christ and be obsessed with what he's obsessed with. Let's see what it is. He said to them, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, to the end of the earth. So, excuse me, they get a revelation here. He says, listen, that's not the issue. It's not the issue. The issue is, is you need power. The issue is, is that you need the person of the Holy Spirit. The issue is, is that the, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. The issue is, is that you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem. You'll be in Samaria, in Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. It was progressive. It was like, okay, you're going to start here. It's going to go there. It's going to go there. It's going to go through the whole world. The issue is, is this is God's 
plan. Not the setting up of an earthly kingdom so that we can all rule and reign, but to reach a lost world now by the Holy Spirit's power. To begin where you are and to reach out around the world. This is what he says to them in this divine encounter just before he goes. My friend, that edict, that command, that call is still in effect. We need to be about our Father's business. And our Father's business is to live in dependence on the Holy Spirit and to preach the gospel, be a witness to Jesus Christ. Now that reaching here that we see, starting with Jerusalem, where they were, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the othermost parts of the earth, I believe that pattern still should be in effect today. So where's my first responsibility? It's right where I am. Right where I am, I need to be faithful. Right where I am, I need to be sharing the truth. And I also have a responsibility for the next place down the road. And the next. And to the world itself. So let me encourage you, if you are a Christian today, take your responsibility seriously in sharing where you are with your friends and with your neighbors and your family. Take that and then look for ways that you can support work that reaches to the next villages, whether it's in Inverness or if you're here in Shady Camp, wherever it is. And we ought to have a view for the entire world. We ought to have missionaries that we are supporting who are ministering in other parts of the world because that's the commission that Jesus gave and he hasn't changed it. So he told them to wait. He said, there's no point in going anywhere until the Spirit comes. And that's what he had told them, to remain in Jerusalem, to watch and to wait. We saw that in the Gospel of Luke. We see it here in Acts chapter uh, 1 verse 4. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem to wait for the promise of the Father. Now, the promise of the Father has come. The Spirit has been given. Christ has been glorified. He's been raised up into heaven. So, now what do I do? Well, what I do now is I understand and I accept that the Spirit has been given. And that the commands of God need to be done. But I also need to understand what is being said here is that I need the person of the Holy Spirit and I need the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to do ministry. I need the Spirit of God. Can't do it without Him. Now, while the Spirit of God has been given to me, do I always live in the fullness of that Spirit? And the answer is no. So what do I need? What I need is to be filled with the Spirit of God. Ephesians commands Christians, be filled with the Spirit. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And so, just as the disciples needed the Spirit's power in order to be His witnesses, so do you. So do I. Can't do this without God. Can't do it without the Holy Spirit. This is not a task that God says, now you go out and get this done. This is a task where He says, you go out and you do this, but you do it independence upon me and I will do it in you and the power will be for me. We are powerless. He is powerful. The word is used here, you shall receive dunamis, which is dynamite power, explosive power. Do you have explosive power in your life? That's what we need. We need the fullness of the Spirit of God at work, friends. And when we do, we will be able to be His witnesses. You know, the power is not given apart from the Spirit. God is not sending down some juice or energy to empower you to do stuff. The Spirit of God is the person, and from that person comes the power. What does that say? It means I need the Holy Spirit in every way. I need to be in dependence on the Spirit of God to be effective in the calling that God has for me. I need the Holy Spirit's presence. I need his person, I need his presence, and I need his power. If I do not have his person, if I am not abiding in his presence, 
I have no power. It might look like power, but it's only fleshly power. I need the person of the Holy Spirit. I need the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I need the power of the Holy Spirit. Three things that we find so real and so true. I've said this in an earlier devotion that we did as we looked at the Great Commission and the calling of God, that some people think the Holy Spirit is a glove, a power glove, and that we are the hand that goes into the Holy Spirit, and because of the power of the Spirit, we can do things. And that is so far away from the reality that the New Testament teaches. The New Testament teaches that we're the glove, and He's the hand. He's the one that has all the power and authority and strength, and we are the puppets in his hands. We're the glove. He's the hand. So when he says, you receive power and the Holy Spirit has come upon you, this coming upon you is the entering in of the Spirit of the living God in my life. It is God invading me. God coming into my territory. And the disciples, much as they had learned up to that point, much as they had experienced in walking with Jesus Christ, they needed something more to be able to do the calling of God that was upon them. They didn't just need the instructions of Jesus because they already had those. He'd already given them plenty of instructions and he gave them further ones after he rose from the dead. In those 40 days, he had given them much instruction. But instruction without power gives me nowhere. Because if I have what I'm supposed to do, but I do not have the means to do it, then what good is it? That's the pathway to frustration. But praise the Lord. God, not only does he tell us what we need to do, but he equips us to do it. And that is the Holy Spirit working in you and in me. So my challenge to all of us, if we are going to live Christianity effectively, if we're going to walk and see power at work, God's power, if we are going to be used of God to evangelize the world, we need the power of the Spirit. We need the person of the Spirit. We need the presence of the Spirit of God. Because without it, we can do nothing. Without Him, we can do nothing. The Holy Spirit has come into the church for Christians to take up residence within them. And I believe that the moment that you're saved, you are born again of the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit comes. But we are in the process of surrendering and yielding and allowing Him to have the complete control of your life. That is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. There's angels at work. Who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken for up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He said, why are you standing around gazing at the sky? He's gone, but he'll be back, and he'll come back the same way he left, giving them that assurance, realizing you don't have to stay here gazing at the sky now. So they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Ju Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and in supplication. This is what happens. This is what happens as they wait on God. You want to wait on the Lord? You need to know that you're unable, you feel the inability, you come short and you're not able. What are you going to do? Pray. Seek the face of God. Cry out to God that we might know His power and His presence in our lives. They all continued with one accord and in prayer and in supplication. 
in request to God, in praying to God. And there was 120 in that room, it says. And the days, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And this is what they did. They began to pray. So, my friends, as we look at this post-resurrection encounter of Jesus Christ, the last one for these apostles to receive the final instructions of God, we clearly understand that Jesus is telling them, I'm sending you a promise. You desperately need this promise. You can't get along without it. And But with this promise, you can reach the world for Jesus Christ. So isn't that encouraging? Isn't it awesome that we have this risen Savior who is giving all that we need for life and all that we need for godliness? He is our provider to give us everything that we need so that we can serve Him. Not so that we can follow our own agenda, as the disciples said, well, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? But that we can follow His agenda. The power the Spirit of God gives to us is for what the Spirit of God calls us to do, and that's to be His witnesses and to evangelize. And he says this, you will be witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, all the way around the globe. And that's what's happened. And that's what is happening until Jesus comes again. And someday he will break the clouds and return. But in the meantime, serve the Lord. In the meantime, share the gospel. In the meantime, pray and be still and know that he is God and rest in the Lord's strength and his power and presence and dependence upon him. That you might truly know the person of the Holy Spirit. That you might truly abide in the presence of the Holy Spirit and that you might experience the power of the Holy Spirit in evangelism, in reaching a lost world for Jesus Christ. Amen. Here's a song I wrote a number of years ago called I Am With You Always. And it says, as Jesus was uh, leaving his disciples, he was giving that encouragement that he is with them all the way through and that the Spirit of God will come. All power is given in heaven and earth to the Lord Jesus. He said to his own, he told them, go then into the whole world, preaching the gospel to all on the earth. always my presence shall give you rest for I am with you always and my presence shall give you rest you'll receive Power when the Holy Spirit comes, for I will send him upon each one. You'll be my witness, both here and abroad. This power in you is the power of God, for I am with you always, and my presence shall give you rest, for I am always and my presence 
shall give you rest. What shall we do then in this present hour? For he has changed not, nor the spirit of power. So let us go forth in dependence on him. And the Lord Jesus, men's souls he will win. For I am with you always. presence shall give you rest, for I am with you always, and my presence shall give